The ADA was signed into law on July 26, 1990 at Washington, D.C., and in the same year, CCDC was founded. That summer, the summer of 1990, Jane Parker and I had the opportunity to, to go to an independent living conference that was being held in Washington, D.C. And when the conference was over, we were asked to stay to lobby for the ADA in Washington. CCDC acts as a way to enforce the principles embodied in the ADA here in all parts of Colorado. As we celebrate the 33rd anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act and Colorado Cross Disability Coalition, we want to take a moment to look back at what has been accomplished in our time. Advocacy was just natural. I just, over time, built, sharpened my sense of right and wrong, just and unjust, and uh, it has been a complete change and I and I do love it. Since our founding, CCDC has helped people with disabilities in areas such as healthcare advocacy and Medicaid problems, solve high impact problems through the CCDC legal program, and increase accessibility for buildings across Colorado like the Capitol Building in Denver. I also think when we got back to Colorado, we realized how many places in Colorado were inaccessible. And I think we pushed to help people decide to report it and to fight it when they could, instead of just meekly accepting things the way they were. We actually had a legislator tell us, there'll be a ramp over my dead body. Well, he has deceased, I believe, and we do have ramps, not ramps, but other methods of getting into the ante room, which is got steps and it's where you meet with legislators if you want to during while they're um, in session. So it's an important place to be, to have that access. Another thing that we took them to over um, was they didn't have any kind of enhanced hearing devices for people who were deaf or hearing impaired. And they were just, it, it was very much an attitude of we don't need to do this. You know, wins are few and far between, and a lot of times progress takes a long time. But what's really awesome is that you get to be around diverse leaders, um, where, so you're constantly getting new ideas and being invigorated by so many different really cool so movements for social change. And because disability impacts everything else, like housing justice, food justice, you know, legal justice, access to justice, we get to you know, transportation, all of those things, we get to be in all of, you know, sit at all of those tables. So it's, it's really cool. Um, it's, you're never bored um, ever. You're always getting to learn and you're always getting to meet new, new people and get new ideas. So it, it's, it's very, I find it very invigorating. It feeds my passion. It, um, I think the proudest moments I have are when I succeed in getting something for someone that wouldn't ordinarily have it. There was a, and both of them are Spanish speaking. There's a Spanish speaking consumer that we had who had cerebral palsy and he needed an elevator in his home to be able to get up to the bedrooms where everybody was and also to enjoy meals with his family. Um, until that happened, he was trapped on the ground floor and people had to come down to include him in the family. And um, it was a fight to get a Spanish interpreter. It was a fight to getting the benefits that he needed. And so in the very end, when we knew that we'd done everything we could, that's when I told him I have CP too. And that really made a difference for the family to know that someone with a disability was fighting for them. Everything we do at CCDC is a team effort. I always say we succeed as a team or fail as a team. And there's so many other people involved. So I get frustrated when people want to think it's me, not our whole team. While it is great to look at the past, let us also look towards the future. CCDC still has much planned and we hope to continue to serve Colorado. We are currently supporting local communities and training the advocates of tomorrow through our own youth program. We also continue to advocate through the legislative session by proposing and supporting new bills that would help many. I think that 
we have a lot more acceptance of people with disabilities in the community than we did when I started. Um, you didn't see people out in their wheelchairs and their scooters in Pueblo. You might have in Denver because that's the center of everything. They have far more resource, resources than we do. And people have learned they don't have to take no for an answer. So I think that's where it goes. But it's always a small group of people who stand up and say, this isn't right and we're not going to take it anymore. And having um, people with disabilities so visible and so present in society is very important. One is pick your battles because if you try to go after everything, you'll burn out. Second is use a sense of humor. Um, what we're doing is critical and not funny, but if you can try and have fun doing that, I think that's important. We want you and we need you. The uh, movement for disability rights and disability justice is not over. Uh, we got some good laws, but they need to be enforced. And the laws that we've got, like the Americans with Disabilities Act, are really a floor, not a ceiling. So they just provide for the bare minimum access, and there is so much more we can do. We still have uh, more than 50% of us are unemployed. People with disabilities are most likely to live in poverty, and that causes problems with a whole bunch of other issues like housing, transportation, you know, general access to society. So those are all of the things that we still need to fix. And we need your voices, your fresh ideas, your energy and your passion. And there is there is plenty of room for you for things. If you're not sure of things, there are people that will be thrilled. And I'm one of them that will be absolutely thrilled to work with you, mentor you, support you, and then let you take leadership. You don't have to wait for someone to give you permission. Just just get involved because advocacy is in democracy actually is all about who shows up. Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Nothing about us without us ever. So good evening, everybody. Let's give that video a big round of applause. Actually, you can do better than that. Let's hear a real round of applause. We, we are celebrating tonight. We're celebrating the ADA and all our wonderful awardees and all the people in this room who make such a difference to help people with disabilities. Uh, my name's Lloyd. I am blessed to be the co-chair of the CCDC Board of Directors. I'm also the CEO of ARC Thrift Stores. How many of you shop ARC Thrift? Okay, we have a bus parked right in front of the museum. We're going to a South Broadway store right after this meeting. I promised Julie I wouldn't do that joke, but I couldn't resist. So we are proud to be one of the largest employers of people with disabilities in the state. We have hired over 500 wonderful employees with disabilities, including many with developmental disabilities. Round of applause for that kind of employment. But my most important title is not CEO. My most important title is DAD, dad. I have a son, Kennedy who is 19 with Down syndrome. He is my greatest teacher and mentor and led me to the honor of working in this wonderful community. 33 years ago, I didn't know what the disability movement was. And as a financial professional, I didn't think it affected me. I was wrong. I was wrong. I am grateful to the people in this room and in this state who had the foresight to fight for the ADA all around the country and in Colorado, like the wonderful people we honor tonight and the people who are no longer with of us, all of us whom fought to create a cross-disability di statewide organization to make sure that ADA became a reality in Colorado. CCDC started as an idea and has grown into a force. We are a force. Over 33 years, we have been influence so much important policy, consumer directed attendant services, Medicaid buy-in, right to wheelchair repair, requirement for accessible government websites, 
requirements for disability representation on important boards and committees. And we are going to implement community first. CCDC is always at the table when healthcare policy is discussed, always at the table when transportation, housing, and employment are discussed. We are at the table to solve problems and to help businesses and governments do their job. And when that doesn't happen, we have something called attorneys. <laughs> so I don't know if you met our attorneys, but you don't want to get on the other side of our attorneys. We have used our legal team to, in quotes, help, help RTD. Our attorneys have assured access at every major sports and public venue, made sure that deaf people have access to communication when interacting with law enforcement, but know that we determine what issues we address from member feedback and that Medicaid is always at the forefront. Medicaid, as you know, is how people get daily support and we will continue to hold our Medicaid agency accountable. We will continue to hold them accountable. We will continue to push knowledge of the buy-in program. We'll help people with disabilities break down employment barriers. And we are proud that CCDC is as large as we have ever seen. We now have more than 25 staff. Just a decade ago, we were mostly volunteers. And now our staff are paid and moving out of poverty. And we want the same thing for everybody with disabilities. We are embarking on a listening tour in a few weeks. Check out our website for the stops. We have some virtual stops if you're unable to attend in person. And we want to hear from you what it is that you want. Please attend one of these important meetings. Also, we are launching a campaign in Denver to push for the Guaranteed Income Program. Just think if people did not have to fear losing disability payments. We're a long way from that, but assuring basic income for those least able to earn enough to stay housed is a huge need. More than 60% of people experiencing long-term lack of housing are people with disabilities, and that's something we must, we must address. We will be implementing the laws that we recently passed. And finally, none of our work happens without your support. We thank all of you tonight and all of our sponsors, and a very special thanks to Rocky Mountain Health Plans for their presenting sponsorship. Their CEO, Patrick Gordon, is here, I believe, and I'd like to invite him up here to give a few remarks. Let's give a round of applause for Patrick. Hey, everybody. Uh, it is great to be with you again uh, this year. This is a lovely uh, setting for this event. Thank you, CCDC. Um, and thank you all uh, for the work that so many of you done, have done for so long uh, to get to where we are today. You know, uh, most of the time we spend our time focused on what is yet to do, what is broken, what is un inequitable, what is unjust. And that's a long list. But, uh, you know, and just thinking about um, you know, the history of the ADA and my own personal history uh, with CCDC, I, I just uh, recall so many moments where CCDC's advocacy and assertiveness uh, drove change. 25 years ago, I was an unpaid intern working at Hickpuff. Julie knows I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to tell the story. And back in those days, uh, stakeholding was not a verb. <laughs> uh, state routinely uh, would uh, make decisions that affected hundreds of thousands of people without getting any consumer input. And CCDC uh, was not down with that. Back in those days, the founders and the leaders uh, in the movement uh, made things very uncomfortable for the agency. And so uncomfortable that they were afraid to go out and meet, and so they sent a 25-year-old intern. Um, <laughs> and so I had the opportunity to meet with Julie and her team way back when, and uh, I can just imagine the look on her face when I was coming in, you know, like, oh God, what did, what did they send me here? Um, but you know, the, the reality is that she and the entire organization was very gracious uh, with her time, sharing their insights, I had my eyes completely opened um, as a young person growing up in this culture 
you know, uh, I, I kind of uh, understood what the ADA was about. I understood some of the advocacy that was happening in the late 80s. And I understood that it was a landmark. But like we discussed here, if the bill is not enforced, if it's not effectuated, it's not real. And um, so Julie and the team shared with me uh, so many deep insights about the experience of people in our culture and our community um, living with disabilities, the injustices, the lack of access, the microaggressions. We didn't use words like that back then, but the reality is that um, I benefited personally so much uh, from that insight, and frankly, it inspired me um, to do uh, anything I've been able to accomplish since. But fast forward to today, uh, there's a string of tremendous policy accomplishments in Colorado. That's not an accident. Um, you know, everything uh, leading up just to the uh, right to repair bill. And by the way, if you guys have not checked out the uh, article, the CPR article that came out a couple of months ago with uh, Robin and Bruce, that is a great story of how policy affects people in their lives, how the delivery of uh, support services and equipment that people need is still not a given, and how people struggle just to, just to live independently these days. But the fact that there is a bill that we can enforce, and there is a fact that uh, people like Robin and Bruce uh, can share their experience is incredibly powerful. But my, my perspective is that um, you know, policy changes are one thing, that's one path to transformation, but it's really cultural change and cultural awareness and creating a more inclusive culture that's truly transformative. And so I, um, in the role that I fulfill, am very honored uh, to be a part of that. I see those uh, uh, injustices every day uh, in the work of the healthcare system. Uh, in the application of Medicare criteria that has nothing to do with what a person needs, or in, uh, you know, frankly, still in the medicalization of every decision. Um, but we're in a position now to check that. We're in a position to chart a different course. We're in a position now uh, to share the values that uh, CCDC has worked so long to promote. So. Again, I am profoundly honored to be here. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of uh, this community. And please, uh, let's continue to work together on all that we can do to drive real change in our, in our state and in our culture. Thank you. Have, having the right leaders Having the right leaders makes it so much easier to do this work, and we are very happy. Um, we've had a very long um, and good relationship with Rocky Mountain Health Plans, with Patrick at the helm, and a great team. And we are very happy that um, Colorado Access has decided to join the list of organizations with awesome leaders, and I'd like to invite Annie Lee to say a few words. Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much. And. Um, hard to follow Patrick there. I'm going to be pretty brief. Um, like Julie said, I'm Annie Lee, CEO of Colorado Access, and I'm just really thankful for this opportunity to express gratitude for the partnership that we've been able to deepen in this past year with CCDC. Um, and I have to say just a special thank you to Julie and uh, Donna Sablon, I don't know if she's here, um, in how they responded when I asked the question as a, you know, new to Colorado Access, what are things that we could do better um, for people with disabilities? And um, words were not minced. Um, there was straight talk and uh, lots of candor. And the learning journey, you know, had begun before as a regional accountable entity, you know, that, that journey that we've all been on has had more than its share of challenges. But to be able to learn and partner the way that we have um, in these past several months has been just invaluable. The perspectives and the, the grace and perseverance with which CCDC works with us and with so many others um, is transformational. It really is something that makes our work um, to really be member-centered, to be person-centered possible. It's, it's something that we constantly have to work on. Um, and 
it has so many dimensions to it and challenges to it that we cannot possibly do the work without the voices of people and organizations um, like CCDC. On a personal note, I'll, I'll share that I am working in healthcare because I started as an advocate, as a 12-year-old, uh, for my parents um, in trying to navigate the healthcare system. And they didn't use these words then, and, but I'll use them now, that they were unable to experience the kind of respect and dignity that people need and deserve in healthcare settings. And I, I think it is now more possible for more people to experience respect and dignity in healthcare settings. Thanks to the voices of you all in CCDC. Um, thank you for using your voices the way that you do to amplify the voices of others. And I think together we truly will build on that floor of the ADA, as Julie said. Thank you. Now we get to do the awards. Um, so I am, I am excited to present the first award, and it is my honor to present the Paul Bilzey Memorial Award to Dr. Jean Parker, who was our founding director and came up from Tucson to be with us tonight. So before I, I talk about the amazing accomplishments of Dr. Parker, I wanted to take a moment to remember Paul. Paul was the person who really started our ADA enforcement work he created what would now be called a social enterprise, I don't think we use that word then either, called Access and Training Consultants. And this was right after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed and the Department of Justice um, would train groups of disabled people who would then go out to train businesses and governments. And Paul is a quadriplegic and also a founding member and the spouse of Jean. Um, was a great leader in this work. And this is the work that really kicked off our role that goes through today in enforcement of ADA. Um, as initially people did hire us to assess their situations and make recommendations. And once that slowed down, um, the, we realized those who were going to comply had done so and that's when we uh, found our lawyers. Um, and engaged our lawyers to do a different level of education. Um, but the story of, uh, of Dr. Parker's career can be summed up as um, is, is prescient. Um, is a brilliant woman who's always been about community, but always also way ahead of her time. When Dr. Parker founded CCDC, um, this organization was her brainchild, but as a true community organizer and leader, she was very intentional about engaging the community, which is people with just different types of disabilities um, from around the state. Um, at the time, cross-disability was not happening, or at least not happening well. Um, most people stayed in single disability groups and the thought of a statewide organization run by and for people with all types of disabilities was unheard of and people thought it would fail and that we would not be capable of self-governance. They were wrong. Um, with support from um, Rich Mail and, and Steve Graham and others from the Community Resource Center, she set up an infrastructure, obtained funding, put together a board. Um, you'll hear from uh, one of our founding board members tonight also, and, um, and had created an independent organization. And she was definitely a strong role model for me as a young advocate when I was new to the state and eager to jump into the work. So since leaving CCDC, she's gone on to do more than I could possibly describe. But uh, a couple things I wanted to point out, speaking of her ability to be prescient. She was always involved in communication and particularly radio. She worked for many years with Radio for Peace International and taught people around the world, particularly those with disabilities, how to use radio for communications. Again, she worked and lived in India for many years, developing courses to be taught in a new format known as online, um, which again was a new thing, um, through the Symbiosis Institute of Media and Communication. And this again was well before online learning was a thing. Um, and she promoted this really as a way to make learning accessible to both students and teachers. Then, if that wasn't enough, as she got her PhD, her doctorate, and this was in 2016, her doctorate was about community-based learning for disaster preparedness. Um, it seems like things have happened recently that maybe made that relevant too. Um, but really, um, the world has, I, I hope, 
finally understood that the role of communities in disaster planning and response is pretty important and that engaged and formed communities are pretty important. And you know how we've come out of the past few years just demonstrates that. Her thesis was transformative emergency preparedness education utilizing community media strategies in rural India. And her field work included action research impact study with two community radio stations. Um, I'm not gonna try and pronounce the towns because um, I'll do it wrong. Um, but, in, but in how this work continues to transform the community's consciousness as they continue to innovate new practices for disaster preparedness. She's currently on faculty at Regis and the Global Nonprofit Leadership Program, College of Business and Economics. We learned today that she was one of the um, professors of our development, our new development director. Um, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, she facilitates and designs courses for graduate students in all levels of nonprofit management, resource development, and implementation. She also teaches social enterprise, um, nonprofit advocacy, social marketing, and she also directs and facilitates online course content um, in economics in the Department of Social Change at the Wilmette Institute, online at the Baha'i Learning Center and the Desert Rose Baha'i Institute, and her course content always centers on community building and social justice. So back to CCDC, um, Jean and Paul both understood on a gut level that a newly passed civil rights law, no matter how aspirational and promising, was not gonna just happen. The promise of the ADA would only become reality if people throughout the country, and especially throughout our great state, were organized. Um, they led in developing something that um, you know goes on today, uh, 33 years later, and will continue to go on as long as it needs to. So Jean, please come join us, and um, Sayana will present your award. I haven't really got much to add after all that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes. Sienna made it. She's speaking very softly here. <laughs> So how did you find out all about all that? I mean, <laughs> I have even I didn't know all that. <laughs> so receiving this award this evening is a true honor. And Julie asked me to talk about the beginnings of CCD. There were many people who were involved in starting CCDC. Many of them are in this room tonight. And two of them are also receiving awards, and please congratulate them. This is their night, too, and they played an integral role in making CCD the organization it is today. When we first started talking about forming CCDC, we envisioned a coalition that would bring disability groups together with a common agenda when appropriate, but also to support single disability groups when requested to do so. We reasoned that we had more in common than not. The many people had more than one disability and they weren't included anywhere in the movement. Colorado was already famous for having a highly developed disability rights movement we wanted to build on the work of groups like the National Federation of the Blind and their wonderful creation of the Colorado Center for the Blind, a world famous training center for blind people to live the life they want. We also wanted to build on the work of ADAPT and the Denver Gang of 19. We're in the History Museum here. In July of 1978, Listen carefully. 19 disabled people went to the intersection of Broadway and Colfax 
three blocks from here, the busiest intersection in this city, to protest the lack of accessible public transport. They got out of their wheelchairs and laid in the street for 24 hours, stopping traffic for miles around. These were the standard bearers. We had to follow. And we wanted to form a group that would use multiple strategies inside and outside of the system, including legislation, policy, legal action, media, and when necessary, direct action to get the job done. When CCDC was founded, groups working across disability boundaries were new. We had to learn as we went, we made mistakes, and we tried again, but we didn't have many examples to follow. Two campaigns from that time stand out as laying the foundation for what CCDC is today. In 1993, Hillary Clinton's healthcare investigation was underway. We decided to hold a series of hearings across the state on how people with disabilities were experiencing healthcare. We invited lots of officials. They were given no microphones. Instead, their job was to sit down, shut up, take notes, and listen, and commit to take action in their particular domain. And they actually came. I think they knew it wasn't going to be boring. <laughs> the results of the hearings were published as a video and a book called An Untold Story. And they were circulated far and wide, including to Clinton herself. Today they can be found in the Denver Public Library. The second one took place in 1995, when members of CCDC sued the state of Colorado under Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act to gain access to the Colorado State Capitol. We had seven plaintiffs, including myself, representing a variety of disability groups. We had one lawyer and 103 defendants. We sued the Office of the Attorney General. We sued the Attorney General as an individual. We sued the legislature as a collective and we sued each of the 100 legislators individually to ensure their personal interest in resolving this case. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? But this was one of those rare times when we really should have asked what could possibly go right. We had sent out invitations to our trial, because that's what you did. And the day before the trial, the judge called everyone in and he said that uh, there would be no trial. Instead, he issued a 17-point court order mandating that the physical space and programs of the Colorado State Capitol become accessible to people with disabilities. <laughs> now disabled people could lobby their representatives and participate in the legislative process unencumbered by steps and other barriers just like everyone else. And I understand that Colorado has at least one legislator who uses a wheelchair. That would not have been possible back then. CCDC became known as a force that meant business, and that reputation continues today. In 1990, when the ADA was passed, we didn't know 
what it would actually accomplish. And those of us who went to Washington to lobby for it were well aware of the compromises that had to be made to get it to pass. The question of whether the ADA has been successful is still to be answered. At long last, we have things like new regulations being written to make government websites accessible. But why has it taken 33 years to do this? Can we really say that accessibility and inclusion are prioritized in this society? Yes, people can now be held legally accountable for violating the ADA, but this has resulted and this has resulted in dramatic change. But when a law like this is passed, things do not become easier. Instead, the responsibilities increase. We have to ensure that the regulations are written that reflect the spirit of the law. But along with everything else we have to do, we are handed the additional task of remaining diligent to make sure that the ADA isn't dismantled through the courts. We all know now how quickly something we thought was settled law can be taken away. The job of those who are entering the movement is to ensure that this does not happen to the Americans with Disabilities Act. CCDC has grown to be one of the most powerful lobby groups in the state of Colorado, and I am immensely proud of the work and accomplishments of this organization. Many people helped form CCDC, too many to recognize, and some of them are no longer with us in person. But I especially want to acknowledge the contribution of Rich Mail, Dan Lopp, and the Community Resource Center, and Steve Graham. Rich passed away earlier this year. He was my friend and colleague, and his and Dan's legacy live on through CCDC. Finally, this award is given each year in memory of Paul Bilsey, who was my husband, partner, friend, and colleague, and champion of accessibility. Together with others, he began CCDC's Access Survey Program. It is a privilege to receive this award in honor of everything Paul stood for and believed. Thank you. I have the honor of presenting the next award. Kristen Castor has spent a lifetime making a difference for people with disabilities. She was born with cerebral palsy, but that did not stop her. She was mainstreamed in Jefferson County schools. She probably paved the way for me, a child with cerebral palsy, to be mainstreamed in the same school district in the late 1970s. Kristen earned both a bachelor's and master's degrees. From 1978 to 1981, she was a Peace Club volunteer in Liberia, West Africa, where she taught English as a second language.
when she needed to work part-time, she was hired by Atlantis Community. She worked extensively with the community and was a champion of the ADA. Kristen then started to do non-attorney advocacy work for CCDC. She filed appeals so families could obtain equipment and services to enable the children to thrive. She was also an integral part of CCDC's organizing efforts. Kristen, Kristen's life exudes what happens when a person decides to use their abilities to help others. She reached beyond limitations, encouraged others, broke down barriers, and led by example. Thank you, thank you, Kristen. It is my privilege to present to you CCDC's Kay McCandless Community Building Award. Brittany, an artist from Access Gallery, started creating art inspired by the Yoruba people, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in Africa. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful award. And just so everybody notices, I am wearing West African tie-dye. It's actually from the um, market in uh, Queen du Sierra Leone, which borders with Liberia. And so I get to honor both things now. When you are born with a disability at a time when there are no services, you become an advocate whether you want to or not just by living your life. <laughs> and I have to tell you, there is no secret to this. You don't have to, have to be a hero. You just do what you want to do. And I know in my heart one of the things that made me most angry was that people with disabilities were segregated into special schools. If you couldn't hack regular school by yourself without assistance, or if you had a terminal illness that the school district didn't want the other kids to see, you were put in a special school. And I rode a bus to school every day with those kids. It so happens that I also was told I could not go to the school in my district because it had steps. Even when I demonstrated that I could climb stairs, I was told I was a liability. And I was sent to the school that didn't have steps. But at least I stayed in the school district in regular school and I was not taught how to be more stupid. And <laughs> I was really angry riding that bus back and forth with people who were as, as intelligent and as motivated as I. The only difference being they needed help or they had muscular dystrophy, and that's where it falls apart. My fiance was Mike Smith, whose last effort was to serve as a figurehead for the Atlantis community. When he was 15 years old, it, he got just too heavy for his mother to take care of him. And she put him in a nursing home close to me. She had no other choice. And it got to the point where he was collapsing and he knew he didn't have long to live. And he said, I don't want to die in a nursing home. And that is when civil rights man by the name of Wade Blank got together and 
borrowed. I think what happened was that the ha it was one of the housing places, you know, the projects. They couldn't keep them full. They were so miserable. That's where Atlanta started, in those places that they couldn't keep full. They put two people to an apartment because they didn't know how the attendant thing was going to work. And Mike was the first one who moved out. Because of Wade, I was able to be Mike's attendant for the last summer of his life. Um, and for that, I will be forever grateful. That's really where my commitment started. Yes, I went on to school when I got my master's degree and all of that. And I went to the Peace Corps in part because I really believed in it. But also, I didn't want anybody to ever have to question me again about how I was going to be able to do the job I had just applied for. It was so maddening. Why would I apply for a job I couldn't do? You know, things are just ridiculous that way. But I didn't intend to do any of this. It was just living my life. I went through high school. I had a boyfriend. I stood by him when times got tough. I went to school. I did not sacrifice my life for this. I went on and did things because they were important to me. And that's how changes were made. When I came back to the movement, it was because my career path had hit a wall. And I had to move back home. I was staying with my dad at 12th and Columbine, which was not very far from where Wade Blank lived. And I ran into him on the sidewalk one day. I was teaching ESL and freshman comp. I was putting together a different package of part-time jobs every semester. And I had worn myself into a frazzle. And I knew I couldn't do it anymore. And Wade said, well, why don't you try our Colorado Springs office? Which didn't last too long. I ended up in Pueblo with a sympathetic um, friend of Wade's, uh, George Florham, who passed away many years ago. And all I can say is, I was just doing what I wanted to do. And it was while I was in Colorado Springs trying to figure things out, the one person you did not mention was, uh, Gene was Dick Laudmill. He was also in there with Dan Lupp. And like all good organizers, he sensed this was an opportunity. And he dragged, while everybody else was climbing the Capitol Hill steps for the ADA, I had just come back home. I didn't know what that was all about. I hadn't stayed in contact. And Dick just grabbed me and ushered me into this conference center where you all were putting together the Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. And all I really knew for sure was that a 501c3 had to have a board, and it had to have bylaws, and a mission and a vision, and that sort of stuff. But I really, beyond knowing that we were trying to make sure that the ADA was enforced and not forgotten, and by the way, it always needs to be enforced, or it will be forgotten. <laughs> Um, I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but once I got involved and then got involved organizing people around the healthcare forums and made contacts and networks, you couldn't stop me. I had come back home. I had found a way, I had found people who said that a lot of the barriers I faced were wrong. They shouldn't have been there, and I could fight them, and I had friends who would help me fight them. And I haven't really stopped. And I'm going to give you a little clue. Looking for a parking place? Uh, well, I don't know if I'll have a parking ticket or not, but I couldn't see what the meter was saying. And I was just putting in a bunch of quarters. So if I end up with a ticket, I'm going to fight it because it was not accessible to me. So, 
So if any of you are feeling intimidated in this room full of vaunted activists, be assured that just do what you want to do. And I wasn't going to let my disability stop me because I know, for God's sake, what I can do and not do. I am not going to try to be a marathon runner. That's stupid. But I will use the talents that I know I have to try to make the world a better place to live. I didn't know it was going to be this way, but it's been very fulfilling and a wonderful adventure, and I intend to continue it. So. I guess, Christina, you're next. <laughs> Hi, I can't believe I have to follow that. Um, I also cannot see a parking meter, and I have also parked in a meter, so maybe we have the beginning of a uh, Kevin. Maybe we had the beginning of a uh, uh, class action here. Um, hi, uh, my name is Hillary Jorgensen. I'm one of the co-executive directors here at CCUC. And I have the immense privilege of presenting the Kathy Vincent Community Building Award tonight to Christina Johnson. Before I tell you the many, many, many reasons why Christina is so deserving of this award, I want to tell you a little bit about Kathy, who the award is named for. Um, so Kathy was CCUC's first bill chair. Um, and Kathy and I actually share a birthday that happens to also be um, the same day the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law. So July 26th. Um, the only difference is Kathy was 50 when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. Um, and Kathy was born with cerebral palsy which means that um, she had speech difficulties and needed um, help with activities of daily living and also used a wheelchair. Because of this, Kathy was placed in a nursing home when she was still a teenager. Um, and she lived in a nursing home um, as a young woman and she was actually one of the people that made it blank um, and Atlantis helped flee from the nursing home. Um, and she finally got to live in the community on her own. Um, Kathy was, one of the memorable things about Kathy is that Kathy was an absolutely rabid Colorado Rockies fan. Um, she had every piece of Rockies paraphernalia on her chair. Um, and, uh, she, you know, never, never missed a game. Um, and even though she missed out a lot on her early life because she was living in a nursing home, um, she had a, she was really independent. And she had a family that always supported her. And, um, so she always resented the fact, um, resented when people couldn't understand her, but would pretend to understand her. Um, in some ways, I feel like Kathy and I are, uh, have a certain connection. Um, so Kathy, was really open about her experiences living in a nursing home. And actually, many years ago, a Medicaid director actually said to Julie 
that um, Kathy had finally convinced this Medicaid director that young people do not belong in nursing homes. Um, so tonight, the person receiving the award named for Kathy is Christina Johnson. And Christina takes the lessons from Kathy um, and has always demonstrated conscious use of self and has been incredibly effective at the Capitol um, by humanizing disability issues. Um, whether it's sharing her personal story or Christina's amazing ability to share the stories of others who may not be able to be in the room, Christina has really excelled at communicating and communicating with decision makers. Um, so Christina has been involved with CCDC since our founding. Um, she is one of, if not the longest, serving volunteer at 33 years. Um, and much of what CCEC is today is because of the foundation that Christina has built. Um, one of the things that I actually learned about Christina when I was putting together these remarks is that when Christina started her advocacy, her disability was hidden. And she was one of the first people with a hidden disability at CCEC to be very open and very proud of her disability. Um, Christina has been active in legislative work in all of her 33 years. Um, and there is a long list of legislation that Christina has been involved in. I'm going to share a few. Um, so I had the pleasure of working with Christina on Senate Bill 144 this year, which was the pain management bill. Um, Christina has done a tremendous amount of hate crimes legislation work, service guard legislation, mental health legislation, Medicaid buy-in legislation, um, helping stop Medicaid managed care from being forced on us. Um, Christina was instrumental in passing consumer election. Also in um, being vocal about voting rights for people with disabilities. Um, Christina worked on the right to repair legislation that has been mentioned several times tonight. Um, and also a number of bills for senior access um, and addressing ageism and discrimination against adults. Um, and she has also looked in disaster response. Um, I also learned this week that Christina was the um, person who started and ran CCEC's summer youth program for many years. Um, all as a volunteer. Christina has done that all as a volunteer. And so, um, me, I am so incredibly honored tonight to give you this award. Thank you. And I'm really happy to see everybody here tonight. Um, this really is an exciting time. I think the work that's been done by CCDC will continue. And I hope that the new advocates that are in part of the whole movement will take it to the next step, whatever that's going to have to be. Um, I think Colorado is unique in many respects. We have a strong independent living movement here and some very strong advocates. So I won't bore you with anything more, but I do wanna say that I think CCDC has really finally reached maturity. <laughs> um, 
I'm not sure we ever thought we would get here, but we did. And it is an organization that is economically solvent, which is a wonderful thing. We used to worry about paying the rent. And I think CCDC has seen so many advocates come and go, but I think deep, deep down, the advocates, their feelings for living with a disability are, are important, and I think we need more work to do, and that work will hopefully be done. So again, thank you for this award. Thank you. Um, I feel like turn it over to Ashley and our new development director, Sayana. I am telling off scripts because we have one more appreciation that we need to do tonight. Julie, do you want to come up here for a minute? Um, so, our uh, development director, Christine Fittler, our former development director, um, <laughs> she left us a few weeks ago. She was nice enough to um, help, help with this event and also help transition to our new development director, Sayana, who you will hear from in a minute. But, Christine, we just want to thank you for um, all of your work and all of your years at service at CCEC. So, we actually had, yes. We, <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Hi. Do you want to say something? No. Thanks, Christine. We really appreciate it. Hello. Hello. Is that working? Yeah. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Lewis. I've been um, sitting on the board for about five years. And um, I practice, so hopefully this goes well because I get super nervous. Um, so the first thing I want to do is thank our major sponsors, Pasco and Fox and Robertson. And also thank VIP sponsors, ARC Thrift Store, uh, Colorado Access, and Craig Hospital. And thank you for generous support for our presenting sponsor, Rocky Mountain Health Plans. So now let's talk about how CCDC has made Colorado history and changed the landscape of our state when it comes to accessibility. I have mentioned this before and I will say it again. Not only people with disabilities benefit from accessible system, but all people benefit from it. Here are three ways that CCDC has done its epic historical work. First, we have sued every major venue in town, such as Pepsi Center, <laughs> Coors Field, Red Rocks, Fiddler's Green, Ellie, Car Ellie Calkins Opera House, and our favorite transportation system and our frenemy, RTD. Second, <laughs> second, we have created an expectation in the state government that people with disabilities are to be included in all policy makings. We have seats on multiple boards, have our Josh Winkler in the governor's office, and people with disabilities are more included here in Colorado than anywhere else. Third, Third, historically one third, historically one third of Americans with disabilities have lived in poverty. CCDC team has worked tirelessly to create two programs that could help us get out of it. First one is the Consumer Directed Attendance Support Services, CDAS, which allows our family members who are our caretakers to be paid. Second is the Medicaid buy-in for working adults with disabilities that allows our community to not have income restriction and to make more money, notably, which has also allowed to move our staff from volunteers to paid staff members. But we still have so much work to do or suing to do. What I have learned about any civil rights law is that it only gave us the right to fight for our rights. That is all. So the Boulder police who failed 
to provide a sign language accommodation that has caused a woman to have her kids taken away needs to be sued. The Denver, the Denver County Court refused to seat refused to seat for a hard of hearing juror because they, they thought CART, communication access real-time translation, was too complicated. They're just asking for it, right? <laughs> because of the issues like this, we need to keep funding litigation as part of fighting for civil rights of people with disabilities. We need to also fund campaigns to educate the legal professionals on their ableism and fund education for our community to know our rights. While the state has invited us to the table, it takes effort for us to be heard. We need more funding to hire more people with disabilities as policy experts and organizers so that the disability perspective is baked into everything. Love that, Julie. Um, too many of us still live in poverty and are afraid to work or unable to give up Social Security. So we are stuck. We need a guaranteed income not tied to disability, dramatically improved education and job training, and overall, more expectations of employment and ability to thrive and not just survive. We need to continue to break down systemic and cultural barriers that discourage work and find ways to support people with disabilities who want to work and break out of poverty. Now let's talk about how we can continue our support for CCDC. We are living in tough and strange times with the post-pandemic, inflation, and now aliens. We may not, we may not donate the way, <laughs> did you catch that? <laughs> I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> we may not donate the way that we used to, as I used to donate to many nonprofits, but now I am very selective about which, which nonprofits that I would donate. I will only choose the ones that my dollars will stretch to maximize impact. CCDC is one of those organizations. And no amount is too little and no amount is too much. And include us in your will as well. Tell your friends, families, colleagues about the great work that we do and tell them to donate. And for more information about our work and to donate money, time, or talent, visit our website, ccdconline.org. Find us on Amazon and King Super's giving programs. Uh, we are also participating in Colorado Gives in December. You can also use Facebook to do a birthday fundraiser for us. Okay, so now, um, now I want to introduce a new player to our team and through and after a thorough search, CCDC has named Sayana Hitt as our new development director. Sayana was one of our youth program coordinators since 2021. Her background includes work in mental health, victim advocacy, youth mentoring, sexual and domestic violence prevention, and education. And she is an independent consultant for Colorado nonprofits. Sayana received her bachelor's in clinical psychology with a minor in juvenile justice from Regis University. She also holds two masters, two masters, um, one in nonprofit management and the other in marriage and family therapy from Regis University as well. Throughout her educational and professional career, Sayana has earned a certificate in strategic leadership among many others others to support her leadership desires in the nonprofit world. Please help me to welcome our new development director. Hi everyone, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I know we're short on time, so I'll keep my um, speech significantly shorter than what it was before. Um, I am honored and um, really accept the privilege to step into this role as development director for uh, Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Um, when I first set out with working with CCDC as a person living with a disability, I had no idea that we had so many barriers and so many issues. Um, I was born with my disability, so you would think that I would know, right? Um, but CCDC has been more than welcoming in educating not only myself, but elevating my voice and getting me to understand the intersectionality of um, disability and how it's non-discriminatory. Um, you never know when you're going to develop a disability. That's kind of the motto here. It's not, do you have a disability, but when, you know, um, because just natural aging. 
Um, in addition to um, all of my accolades that uh, Ashley so graciously um, outlined, I want to just kind of introduce my mission um, in this position for CCDC. I really want to elevate our voice and really kind of change our culture around um, individual giving and how we see ourselves participating in our liberation. Um, a lot of our systems that currently exist and our thought process um, has really boxed us in as people with disabilities to not thrive, right? Like we, we have to survive. We're worried about what's happening next, how we're going to do this, how we're going to do that. But how do we actually thrive and live the life that we have determined for ourselves? So that is my goal in this role. I want to elevate our voice even further and use um, my efforts in the community connection to further the mission of thriving, right? The ADA is the floor. That is not the ceiling. There is so much more work to do. There is so much more to accomplish. And we deserve to thrive. We are not going to just survive anymore. So I humbly accept and I'm so privileged and honored to go from the trajectory of being a fellow in a year <laughs> to developing, or not even developing, kind of revamping uh, Christina's youth program um, introducing that back into the community. And then now I'm in the, a leadership position. I am so honored and thankful. And um, I also want to give a special shout out to uh, Dr. Jean Parker um, because she was my capstone um, professor for my nonprofit management degree. Um, it is wild how that comes full circle, right? Um, so I thank you for assisting me in that journey and really giving me a great foundation um, to accept this role and to thrive in this role as well. Um, I want to give a special acknowledgement also as well um, to Dr. Rachel Storm here in the back. Um, I don't know how many of you have been able to see the historical exhibit that they have specifically put together um, for this event. So please um, get a little glimpse of disability history. Um, we know that we're not taught that in school intentionally. Don't ever uh, think that that was you know, a secret. Um, they do that on purpose. Um, but also know that uh, Dr. Rachel um, Storm is a resource if you have any other questions. Um, finally, we have a lovely silent auction over here in the back with our CCDC logo table. Um, the auction will close in four minutes, y'all. Um, <laughs> so please go and make your final bids if there's anything um, that you're interested in. Um, and again, I am so humble and grateful and I am so thankful for this privilege and this position and I owe Christine so much um, for mentoring me the last year um, for this position. And I am so thankful to our co-EDs um, for having the faith in me to do this. Um, thank you all for everything. I hope you have enjoyed your night. Um, and again, the silent auction closes in three minutes. Um, and we appreciate you. And please feel free to donate. Thank you. Have a good night.